your children, their children, their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family and your children and their children and their children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just thank you, Lord, for another time in your presence. Father, we give you all the glory. Father, we give you all the praise, O oh God. We ask, O oh God, that your presence will fill here. Your spirit, O oh God, will move like never before. Father, and to you will be given the glory and praise. Hearts will be lifted, O oh God, Jesus. That, Father, Lord, you will touch the brokenhearted, O oh God. Father, we give you the glory and praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Good evening, church. Good evening, church. Are we ready to praise him this evening? Amen. We're in his presence this evening. We just want to worship him and give him all the glory and praise. We say our God is greater. Our God is stronger. There's nobody like him. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you.
I stand amazed in your presence. There is nothing you cannot do. I stand amazed in your presence. There is joy, peace, and hope. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you in all the earth. No one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you. You do mighty things. You do your name you do my you do my things you do glorious things you're a faithful god awesome is your name oh i stand amazed i stand amazed in your presence there is nothing there is nothing you cannot do
filled your glorious things. Your faithful God, awesome is your name. You do mighty things. You do glorious things. You're a faithful God. Awesome is your name. Hallelujah. 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 Our God is good. He does wonders and he does mighty things. Let's just continue to appreciate him. Let's open our mouth and just magnify the name of the Lord. He's a wonderful God. He's full of wonders. And he's always unleashing his wonders on us as his children. Let's appreciate him tonight. Let's magnify the name of the Lord. Being alive today again is a big deal. It's a mighty thing. Let's appreciate God. Let's honor him. Father, we exalt your name. We declare you are truly a wonderful God. You do wonders and we are a testament of the fact that, Lord, you have been so mighty and so gracious to us. We praise and we honor your name tonight. As we come before you tonight, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to come even today, December 20th, 2023. We are grateful, Father, for life, for peace, for joy. Thank you, thank you, thank you that we are standing in the land of the living today. It's a big deal, and we are grateful for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we give thanks. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you very much for the worship time. We are still going to praise the name of the Lord some more. And I want to engage the passage in the book of Psalm 146 as we give God thanks tonight. Psalm 146, I will read from verse 1. The psalmist says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Why is the psalmist emphasizing the fact that for every day that he catches breath, he will praise the Lord? Because he understands the fact that the Bible says in Job chapter 33, verse 4, he says that the Spirit of the Lord has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. And the understanding I have is that for you to be able to move your car around, you need to visit the gas station. And when you get to the gas station, you make payment in exchange for the gas that will move your vehicle around. The same thing, life of God is what moves us around on a daily basis. Even those people that are on life support machine, it's not the life that is truly support. It's not the machine supporting their life. It is actually God who has given them life. If you take life support machine to the morgue, will they wake up? They won't. So I want us to thank God because indeed every day that we receive is bread. It's a day to give him thanks. Let's appreciate God. That's the payment for life, to give God praise. That's why the psalmist also says in Psalm 150 verse 6, let everything that has bread praise the Lord. Let's open our mouth and give God praise for life. Let's appreciate him that we go out and come in and we are not victim of gun violence. Father, we praise your name. We are not victim of drunk drivers on the road. Lord, we praise your name. We are grateful, Lord, that this year has gone and it is gradually going down and we see that our life is not going down with the year. We praise and we honor your name. Some people started December and today they are no more. Father, we thank you that none of us have been a victim. No member of our family have been a victim of violence. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for life. And we also declare like the psalmist says, as long as we have our life in us, we continue to declare your praise. While we live, we will praise you. We will sing your praise as long as we have our being. Lord, we thank you because you deserve much more than what we can offer. We praise and we honor you, our King. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Verse 5 says, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. Whose hope is in the Lord is God. I want us to open our mouth one more time and thank God because the God of Jacob has been our help. He has been our present help 
at all times. The Bible says in Psalm 46 that it's our present help in trouble. I want us to appreciate God for he has been our present help. He has been our timely help. He has been our effective help. Some help comes, but they can't do much. But God has been timely, he has been effective, and he has always, always, always been more than enough for us. Let's appreciate God for being our help. We thank you, Father. The God of Jacob has been our help. And we praise your name for the help you have received. Even as a church, we have received your help. We magnify your name. We rejoice in your faithfulness. Thank you, precious Lord. We say, Lord, indeed, our hope is in you. And you have never let us down. You have never let us down. We praise and we honor you. Our King and our God, we celebrate you. In Jesus' mighty name, we praise. Verse 7 says, who executes justice for the oppressed? Who gives food to the hungry? There are several areas of our life where we have been hungry in the course of this year. But God has satisfied our hunger. He has been the one giving us food. Sometimes we are spiritually hungry. Sometimes it's emotionally hunger that we have. At times it's even health hunger that there's just an area of our life that something is just not adding up. But God, the Bible says, he gives food to the hungry. I want us to praise the name of the Lord one more time for every way that God has fed us this year. In every area of our life that God has fed us this year. He has indeed, Lord God Almighty, be more than enough for us. Father, we thank you. We praise your name because you indeed feed the hungry. And we attest to the fact that we have been hungry in the course of this year. But Lord, we have satisfied our hunger. We thank you because you feed the hungry. We praise and we honor your name. We are grateful, Father. Some of us were hungry for a new job. God gave us new job this year. Some of us were hungry for babies. God gave us babies this year. Some of us were hungry for healing. God gave us healing this year. Father, we thank you because indeed you feed the hungry and we are part of the hungry that you have fed this year. So Lord, we praise and we honor your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we praise. Amen. Verse 8 says, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Hey, I want us to thank God for the light of his word. I don't take it for granted that you can look at the word of God and it can make, it can make sense to you. Because the Bible says that those who are perishing, that the word of God is foolishness to them. But for you, for me, it's not foolishness. It's because we are not perishing. I want us to open our mouths and bless the name of the Lord. For open our spiritual eyes in the course of this year. Every time we have the opportunity to hear the word of God in this house, God has been speaking in the, in the heart that is clear and loud. He has been speaking in a language that we can comprehend. Let's appreciate God, Father, we thank you. We are grateful, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. You have opened our eyes. You did not allow us to grow a but in the dark. We thank you, Lord. You open the eyes of the blind. Spiritually, Lord, you have been opening our eyes. You did not allow us to grope in the dark. You did not allow the enemy to rob us of what is duly ours. Lord, we praise your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you for opening our eyes. Lord, thank you for opening our eyes. You did not allow us to grope in the dark. We praise your name. Lord, we thank you for the light of your word that has been coming to us in the course of this year. Lord, we celebrate and we honor you. We thank you, Lord, that your word is not scarce in our life. When we are, Lord God Almighty, down in hope, we come again and we receive the word of hope and our hope is, ex is lifted. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Hopelessness kill faster than death. Lord, we thank you because we were not subjected to hopelessness. We have found hope in you. Lord, we praise your name. We honor you and we worship you. Thank you for your word that you always send to us. We celebrate and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name, we praise. Lastly, verse 10, it says, The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion. Permit me to say, Your God, O DIC Cypress. To all generations. Shall we praise the name of the Lord? Because he's exalted over DIC Cypress and he will continue to reign forever. I appreciate God because the Lord will reign in your home, he will reign in your life, he will reign in your health, he will reign in your finances forever. The reign of darkness has come to a permanent end in our health, in our families, in our church, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you because you reign forever. We are grateful, Lord, that your reign in here is a cypress. It's not a seasonal one. Lord, we thank you because you reign forever. 
We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We exalt your name, Lord. Even tonight, Lord, as we gather, we ask, oh Lord, that you will reign. Reign over this gathering tonight in the name of Jesus. Let the mind of the Father be unlocked to us tonight. In the name of Jesus, shine your light into our heart. Even as you reign over this service tonight, Father, we thank you because you will exalt your influence over us. And our life will never remain the same. We celebrate and we honor you, our King. In Jesus' name mighty name we praise in jesus mighty name we praise please be seated thank you very much for making it to church tonight we truly appreciate god for your life and for those who are joining us online we acknowledge you and we appreciate you also even as we look at the word of god tonight i believe god will bless us tonight again with his word i want to encourage you please this is actually where the miracle lies the miracle is not just in you being laid hands upon and you fall and uh, you see things. Because the thing is this, the demon can leave you. But if you are not rooted in the world, he will come back and still find a place. But I refuse that the devil will find a place in your life in Jesus' name. And that is the reason why Bible study is extremely important. Because that is what really gives us access to our inheritance in Christ. Yeah, God can intervene by the way of miracle and do some things. But those things that God is doing as a matter of a miracle or a divine intervention will only be sustained on the strength of his word. On the strength of his word. On the strength of his word. And as we look at the word tonight again, I trust God that strength shall be added to us in Jesus' name. We'll be bringing the fourth installment of the series we started like uh, four weeks ago, titled, It's Time to Reset. It's time to reset. In other words, we've gone through the year and it's been a busy year. Several activities have gone in the course of the year. And God is saying, now press the reset button. The same way we see our system acting up, I'll be like, okay, what's wrong? They tell you, okay, do factory reset. And when you do reset, what it does is it clears all the rubbish that is making the system to be slow or that's not making the system to work effectively. And God is also telling us, as we are winding down the year, and we are stepping into a brand new year, 2024, it's time to reset. It's time to reset. So the first week, we looked at what does it mean to reset, and we established the fact that to reset is to rearrange, is to create order, is to set priority for your life. To reset is to set again, to adjust some things. Some things have been working in your life, but if you can just realign them a bit, they can actually work much better. Your marriage can work better if you will press the reset. Your finances can also do better if you press reset. So that's what God is saying to us. To reset is to create order because it's order that will make room for increase in your life. And you know what God says to us that the path of the righteous is like the shining sun. Is shining ever brighter onto the perfect day. So our 2024 must be a great improvement on our 2023. And God is saying the way that can happen is when we create order. Because when you create order, it makes room for increase. Order is simply an accurate arrangement of things. In other words, you put things in their proper perspective, how it should be. And that's what we discussed in the first week. The second week we talk about the first priority you must set as you are creating order, we say what actually needs to be done for you to have order in your life is to set priority. And the first priority, the first thing that must take place in your priority list is God. Because the Bible says in the beginning, God. So everything starts with God. So if your life, you also take order in the pattern of what God has done in his word, in his word that we see all around us, then we must also let God be the first in our life. So when we put God first, we establish the fact that we will never be the last in life in the name of Jesus Christ. So last week, which was part three, we look at the second level of order must be God, number one. Number two must be yourself, yourself. You are the best gift that you have been given to serve to your world. So if your gift is not well packaged or well ordered, it will not be well served. So yourself must be the next one on the priority list. God first, yourself second. Because if you don't take good care of yourself, then you can't give what you don't have. It is what you have been able to put in you 
that you are able to share with other people, your family first, and you begin to go like that. So we look at what does it mean to give priority to yourself? Take good care of your health. That's one of the things we said. And we say, in the light of taking care of your health, what are the things you should watch out for? Eat right. Eat right. We use the scripture in Proverbs 13.3 that say, he who guard his mouth, preserve his life. And we did mention that some people, you want to cast out demons that are threatening you, but the demon is actually that thing you are putting in your mouth right there. So the demon doesn't have power until you are, use your own hand to put it in your mouth. So the Bible says, set guard, and guard is like a door. So put door on your mouth and decide what comes into your mouth. <laughs> when you set guard, you decide what comes. Some things you see, you say, no, this is devil. I cast you out. <laughs> and then when you do that, the Bible says you will preserve your life. But when you allow just anything to come into your mouth, I'm telling you the truth. The Bible says you are setting up yourself for destruction. You must be able to know that at a certain age, you should be able to reduce some intake of sodium, of sugar, of fat. It should be reduced at the barest minimum. As you are growing in age, your sugar, salt, and fat should be reducing. So the older you are, the lesser of those things you should be taking. Uh, so we say we should regulate what goes into our mouth because what goes into our mouth can actually affect our health a great deal. We also mentioned that we should be doing exercise and we made it very simple that walk around. You know, so many of us always want to register in January, New Year, New Resolution. You register in gym. But the gym will always be full in the first two weeks. Go and look at it in Feb mid-February. The car park is empty. Why? The resolution is gone. But the way you can keep it simple is to walk around. We were able to see some statistics that was very frightening to say to us that when your legs are actually, 50% of the muscle in your body are actually on your legs. So when those 50% are really active, it has a way of telling on the muscle of your heart and your heart will also be healthy. Statistics have shown that. We quoted all those statistics last, Sunday, uh, last Wednesday. So please, you can go and look at it on YouTube if you want to listen to more of that. Part of what you have to do to take care of your health is to rest. Is to rest. Rest is actually part of living. It's part of living. God didn't rest because he was tired. God rest, rested so that he can show us a pattern that you cannot just run your life. Just imagine you driving your car and there's no day you take it for service. When you take it for service, it's actually rest you are giving the car. They bring out the engine oil that is dirty. They put fresh one. So when you are also resting, engine oil is being, is being uh, removed from your body and some fresh one have been put to be able to keep you active. And part of what it takes to take good care of your health is to have a joyful spirit because the Bible says that a joyful spirit does good like medicine. So some of the medication you are using to suppress the depression is actually a waste of time. Just maintain a joyful spirit. You will not need all those, all those medication again. I'm telling you. A joyful spirit, the Bible says, it does good like medicine. Medicine. But a sorrowful spirit dry up the bone. That's what the Bible says. I won't take too much time because I have barely 30 minutes left on this. So let's go to today's teaching. So the first thing on your priority list must be God. The second thing on your priority list must be yourself. And the third thing on the priority list is what we'll be looking at at this fourth installment and it's your family. Your family. Relationship is more important than your achievement. I said this thing sometimes ago on this altar, and I don't know why it came to me, but I believe it's the Holy Spirit that put it in me. How do you know the people you should spend the most part of your life with? How do you know the people you should spend most part of your life with? Pause and think about it. That if you go to be with the Lord today, who are the people that will miss you most? Your office, I doubt it. Your office cannot miss you as much as your wife will miss you, as your husband will miss you. Your office can miss you as much as your children will miss you. So, those people that will miss you most are the people you should spend the most part of your life with. 
Though relationship is way, way more important than your achievement. First Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. God was doing a recruitment into his business. You know, God, the salvation of souls is God's business. In fact, Jesus Christ called it, I must be about my father's business. And God was doing a recruitment exercise to say, who are the people I will put in managerial role in my father's business? And this is the criteria. Look at it. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. He said, one who rules his own house well. God is saying, you are not fit to lead in my house, in my business, if you have not been able to rule your house well. It's so important to God. You know why God is saying that? Because the truth is this, if your, house, if your home is not happy, you'll be a sorrowful person. And when you are a sorrowful person, everything you do will be colored with the same sorrow. So you become a point of frustration in the body, in, the, in, the, in God's business. And God is saying, no, I don't want that. Have you been to some organization before? You are talking to uh, maybe the receptionist or the front desk officer, and you are just like, why, why is she just so saucy? Why? She's coming from a very terrible home. If she had left the home that day and the husband is in high spirit, she's in high spirit, every customer she will meet that day will be like, oh my God, this lady is amazing. But if she's just so, she's just so bitter about life, she's just, she just feels cheated by the husband, everyone is just, she will come and just vent the anger on every customer that cross. And God doesn't want you to vent anger on his customer. So God is saying, no, you know what? If you will lead in my house, one of the major criteria is that you must rule your home well. Your home must be in peace. Your home must reflect my value. Then you are qualified to actually be a leader in the body of Christ. So if that is important to God, I want you to know that it must be important to you too. It must be important to you. Whatever you achieve in life at the expense of your family is worthless. Please, let that be at the back of your mind so that you never forget it. Whatever you achieve at the expense of your family is worthless. There's a saying in my dialect. They say that a child that you do not train, you will have to tame. You know why? Because a child that doesn't have the father and the mother to correct and to give instruction and to guide. They will eventually become wild. And when they become wild, what happens? They will have to be tamed. That's why a child you do not train, you will be forced to tame. And you know where they tame children? Juvenile prison. Juvenile jail. That's why they tame them. Because they are out of control. Do you agree? Because they are out of control. They won't obey teacher. They won't obey the, the, the law of the land. Then they will have to keep them in a place where they will be forced to obey. That's them. They are taming them. They are like wild lion. They have to tame them. Why? Because parents face to train. So a child you face to train, we eventually have to be tamed. I trust God that none of your own children will be tamed in Jesus' name. So it's very important to God. Whatever you achieve in life at the expense of your family, is worthless. It's worthless because one of the things that is topmost on God's agenda is that the value he has put in you, the light you have contacted, the salvation you have received, you will also communicate it to the next generation. God doesn't want anything he does for you to die with you. So if you have come to the light, you are no more in darkness, then God will hold you responsible to show the light to your children. Yes, you can't change them, you can tell them and you can keep praying for them. Because when you pray for them, you are accessing their heart at the level where they can reject. So God is counting on us. It's the family that we must begin from. After you have put God first, yourself second, then your family. Why is family so important? Family is the place where our characters are forged and our mindset are shaped. So you've seen somebody woke up one day and just feel like, I hate these people because their color is not like mine. And he carry a gun and shoot them. That is the mindset that has been created in the home. I'm telling you. If he had all his life, he had the parent talks about everybody's same God created us. We are this, we are that. He will never grow up and have a mindset of being superior to another being. 
to the extent of taking the life of somebody. So it's in the family that our characters are forged and our mindset are shaped. Your family is the one that knows the worst about you, but they believe the best about you. Have you seen, <laughs> have you seen some parents, the children will say, oh, people in my class always tell me my head looks like a, like a square. The parents say, no, your head is the best. Why? Who will call his own rubbish? Do you understand? Because that is truly what family is meant for. Family knows the worst about you, but they believe the best about you. Other people outside won't do that. Why? Because you are not their priority. So you must also place such a premium on your family, on your husband, on your wife. Don't, don't join the outsiders to say that your husband is rubbish. Even if he's misbehaving, you keep praying and keep declaring what you want to see. That's where you can actually have a home that you desire. It is not in talking about the negative and the negative and the negative that will bring the joy that you desire. Because truly, why were you talking about the negative? Because you want him to change. But you talking about the negative is affirming the negative. So rather than you talking about the challenge you are going through with your spouse, why don't you talk about the destination you are heading for with your spouse? Is that not what the Bible teaches? The Bible says we call for those things that be not as if though they were. So use your mouth to rewrite the situation you don't like in your home. Rather than using your mouth to affirm and affirm and affirm it. That is the way to go. Your family will know your lapses and they will help you fix it before your enemy spots it and take advantage of it. That is what the family is meant for. And that is why it must be given priority. The family is a link between your past and your future. So you cannot afford to neglect it. You cannot afford to neglect your family. The family is a link to your past and a bridge to your future. You will always need your family. When all chiefs are down, it's only your family that will remain with you. Everybody will tell you, you know, you know, I have, I have my children to take care of. At that point, what do you do? They should not take care of their children? No. So you also must ensure that you give priority to your family. I love what C.S. Lewis says. One of the founding fathers of faith, C.S. Lewis. He said, the homemaker has the, homemaker has the ultimate career. The homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist for one purpose, to support the ultimate career, which is building your home. Do we get that? He said the homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist for one purpose only, and that is to support the ultimate career. What he's saying there is this. Everything you do must be such that it's building your home. If something is tearing your home apart at the expense of the benefits you are deriving from it, it's not worth it. That's what C.S. Lewis is teaching us there. That if anything is tearing your home apart because you are deriving some benefit from it, it's not worth it. The benefit cannot be compared to what your home could deliver to you. So he says, every career you do must be to support the ultimate career. And the ultimate career is to build your family. Is to build your family. I said jokingly to us last, last week, I said Psalm 127, the Bible says children are the heritage of the Lord. And when you say heritage, you are talking about God's property. And you are just a caretaker. And you know a caretaker does not go ahead and just treat the property anyhow. What will happen? The owner will, 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 will release him of his job. So I pray that God will not release you of your role as parents in the name of Jesus Christ. So we must be consistent at building our home. So talking about priority and we are saying families, it's, it's interesting that ladies actually, uh, they derive their self-esteem from relationship. That's why you will see a lady will do anything for the guy they like. A lady will do anything for the children. For, uh, the mother will do anything for, for her children. Uh, fathers at times can actually be, mm, 
women. Some of them will just walk away. But ladies will not do that. Ladies derive their self-esteem from maintaining healthy relationships. Why men derive their own self-esteem from work? I don't know why that happened. Maybe when God created Adam, he gave him work before he brought wife. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking aloud. Because God actually said to Adam, this is the garden. Tend it. That's his work. It was after that. I said, ah, this guy has been struggling alone. It's not good for man to be alone. Let me now bring wife. But for a woman, the day a woman woke up, all he knew was, this is your husband. And that's why, just, 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 that's why the Bible says that the love of the woman will always be towards the husband. It's in the book of Genesis chapter 2. So, ladies derive their self-esteem from relationship. Why are we saying this? So that we can know. Because when we know our configuration, it helps us to avoid clashes. So, when you see your husband wants to be on computer at 1 a.m., don't kill him. Just encourage him that, my dear, you know you need to rest. I know you, I know you like to work. It's to take care of us, eh? But we will be fine. We'll be fine. Shut down the system and go and sleep. Rather than you nag him and nag him and nag him. That's a better way to communicate your mind. Why? Because that's where he derives his self-esteem from. The same thing. <laughs> this is actually talking to me. My wife will love me wherever she is now. When you see a woman talking about this child, this child, this child, I'm like, ah, leave them, please. It's because that's where they derive their self-esteem from. Relationship. Mothers derive their self-esteem from nurturing their children. Fathers, we derive our relationship from our work, from what we do, from what we do. So when we have this understanding, it helps us relate better with each other as husband and wife. So that we avoid clashes. Those things that you know that mm, that is just his own. Let me look for a way to communicate it in such a way that we get what I want him to do and he will do it. And I know that uh, in DIC Cypress, our women don't have toxic tongues in Jesus' name. <laughs> because some people, their tongue is acidic. When they finish talking to you, you just feel like a part of you is burnt. <laughs> so... Our, our women are blessed. And the, 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 the Bible says our world must be seasoned with salt. Our world must carry grace. So the same thing you are saying, you can communicate in such a way that the man will obey you without you adding some acidic elements to it. Most men will choose their work instead of their families. It's just unfortunate. But the Bible is calling us to the place of knowing that that is not the right priority. The right priority is God. Take care of yourself and your family, then you cannot begin to look at other things. The family needs your presence more than your presence. In other words, men are guilty of this. We are guilty of this. We feel like I've given all you have. I've given all you need. But no, what a woman truly needs for a man is him. You just want the man to just be. There's just, there's just, a, there's just an ambience of peace when the father is around, when the, when the, when the man of the house is around. There's just an ambience of peace. So it's more than you just go and you just say, oh, my dear, I, I will send you the, I will send the money to you now, but I'm, I'm joining another flight to another stairs. Ah, after two weeks, <laughs> no, they want your presence in the house. The, period, the family wants your presence more than your presence. Yes, I know that um, mothers have, our wives have told me to advocate that they need a present too, please. And this is Christmas time, please. They need a present. But the presence, they need more than the presence. So don't just be throwing the present to the children without you finding time to also be with them. It's very important that we, we do that. Most times, many of our family challenges come from the lack of order that we place in our family. I understand balancing work and family could be very difficult. I am also working on this very, very consciously. I'm working on it very consciously. But one thing we must also remember is that it's not how hard you work that make the effort worth the while. That's just the truth. It's not really how hard you work. It's only in God blessing your work. So if you feel like it's your hard work, it's you doing it, burning the midnight candle that makes you really deliver, I'm telling you, too, it's not right. It's not true. The Bible says, Paul, may plant. 
Apollo may water. In other words, they could put all of the effort. It's God that gives the increase. So if you do all the laboring, have you ever thought about it? How many professors own university? They are the ones that know all the book. Whereas, go and check all the people that own university. Maybe they are not even PhD. It's when they have the school, they will now confer honorary degree on them. Go and check. I'm telling you the truth. It is the blessing of the Lord that truly make rich and it has no sorrow. So you don't want to trade your health for your wealth? Then learn to rest in God and ask him for wisdom to balance the work-life relationship. It has to be balanced. It has to be balanced. It has to be balanced. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 21, 31. It said, the horse is prepared for the day of battle. In other words, you do all the preparation, all the labor, all the hard work. It said, but victory is of the Lord. So you can do all the preparation. If God has not put his blessing on it, it will still amount to nothing. I said Proverbs 21, 31, not 31, 31. Proverbs 21, 31. Ecclesiastes 9, 11. Ecclesiastes 9, 11. It says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. It's not how fast you are that makes you win the race. Have you watched Olympic? Are you like, man, the way this guy is going. And just along the way, something just happened. Oh, my God. So the Bible is saying the race is not for the swift, nor the battle for the strong. Those people that really have FT, uh, what's it called, muscle, go and look at them. They are actually truck loaders. <laughs> but you see the man that owns the factory. He's just, he just one tiny size like me. He says, no, the battle is not for the strong nor bread for the wise, nor riches for the men of understanding, nor favor for the men of ski, but time and chance happen to them all. Time and chance happen to them all. And you might want to say, okay, so how do we get to be positioned for time and chance? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, he said time and chance is in his hand. You can see, so what makes you really succeed? Is God placing you at the right place at the right time doing the thing? And the chance will just come. And they say, why? This is the right person. And that's it. And who controls that? Who is the one that plays the chest? It's God. He controls the times and the season. So when we learn to trust him for wisdom, ask Holy Spirit to say, help me balance this thing. We will say that what we have done in years past, that we labor, 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 in you resting in God and trusting his wisdom, you will achieve more in 2024 than you have labored for in years past. And that's why God is telling us to press the reset button so that you don't jump into year 2024 and just begin to do, you know, some people do five jobs per day. They clock out from one to go and clock in another to another to another. And as they are clocking in the fifth one, they are dozing off and like, what is this? What is this? No, the Bible is calling our attention to the fact that, yes, it's good to work hard, but we must always remember that it is God that put his blessing on what we do. So, number one, put God as the first priority. Number two, take care of yourself. Number three, your family. Number four, your work. God is not against work. In fact, God himself is a worker. You hear Jesus Christ say, my father works and I work. So, it's not wrong for you to work. So don't take the fact that I need to take care of my family. I just be with the family. No, don't let hunger kill your family. You need to work. It's absolutely right. God wants us to work. In fact, the Bible says that he that does not work should not eat. Because it's in engaging the grace, the gifting, the skill that God has blessed you with, that you exchange your value for resources then you can use to take care of your family. And in that also, you can be a blessing to other people. So work is good. It's just we should not place it above God. We should not place it above ourselves. We should not place it above our family. We should learn to put it in its proper place. So when decision needs to be taken and you have to decide between God and your work, God said, no, for your good, take me first. You need to decide about your health and your work. He said, you know what, for your good, take your health first. 
You need to decide about your children and your work. Take your children first. Then you can now look at your work. So work is simply doing it, engaging yourself in exchanging your value for resources. That is work. But you work, you must do your work diligently. What does it mean to be diligent? It's simple, doing it well. That is just the simple. Work is doing it. Diligence is doing it well. Don't just do it. There, there, there's a passage now that skipped my mind. I, I read this somewhere. No, it was not a passage. It was, it was just a, a one of those um, quotes that came to me. Uh, that any man that does only what is expected of him will never stand out among the pack. So in the place of doing your work, you must also do it with excellence. Excellence is the one that will put you slightly above your peers. What is excellence? Continuous improvement. If you have done it today and they say you score 60, when you are doing it the next day, at least score 62. And if you keep going up and up like that, in no time, your organization will recognize you. So if you do bare minimum that everybody is doing, then that is not expected. That's not what is expected from you as a child of God. So diligence is doing it well. Going extra mile a bit more. As a, as a customer, uh, what's it called, relational officer, you are not, you are not told to uh, be nice. You are not told to be kind. You are not told to um, smile at your customer. All they have told you is to just get the job done. But you must know that, okay, you must also go to the place of putting a smile on your customer. And they will also become your heart outside of your office. When they'll be talking, when you go to the office, ask for this person. She will serve you better. Why? Because you are doing it well. So that's diligent. And God is asking us to do our work with diligence. Do your work with diligence. In the year 2024, if you have been laid back and just do the bare minimum in the year 2023, don't do the same thing in 2024. Do your work with diligence. Do it well. Do it in such a way that if they have to look at it in your organization and say, who can we give this job to? Let everybody that we analyze the case always say it's you. That is, is an indication that you have diligence in your work. You have diligence in your work. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 12, 24. It said, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. I love the way the Passion Translation says it. Proverbs 12, 24, Passion Translation. It says, if you want to reign in life, we are people of dominion, we reign. If you want to reign in life, don't sit on your hands. Instead, work hard at doing what is right. For the slacker, we end up working to make someone else succeed. So, those who do bare minimum, they will always be at the back, reporting to other people. But if you always... Be diligent at your work is a matter of time. God, who controls time and season, will create a space for you at the top. That's what that passage is saying. Also, Proverbs 22, verse 29, it said, Do you see any truly competent worker? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. And this particular scripture was actually re, or was lived out in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we know the story. There was famine in the land of Canaan, and Jacob had sent his children to go to uh, buy grain, and eventually they stumbled into their brother. They thought they've killed uh, Joseph, and Joseph said to them, go bring my father, go bring your family, and let's stay to in the land of Egypt. And when they came to the land of Egypt, he took them to the, the president, that's Pharaoh now, the king of uh, Egypt. And he said to them, my family had come from Canaan, and this is where they are. And Pharaoh said to them, what is their occupation? In other words, we don't allow lazy people around us. What is their occupation? And he said, they are actually shepherds. I said, oh, okay, look at what he now said. Verse 5. Genesis chapter 47, verse 5. Very profound. You know that scripture we read earlier in 
Proverbs 22, it says, have you seen a competent worker? He will stand before king. Look at what the Bible says in Genesis 47, verse 5. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, your father and your brothers have come to you. Verse 6, the land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brother dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, they are all his brothers, they are all his family members. But he said, those who will serve before me, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he said, only competent. Have you seen that in that scripture? He said, if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief headsmen over my livestock. What God truly desires is that we not serve ordinary people. That we secure a place for us in the committee of greatness. But he said, no, prayer won't take you there. Your competence will usher you in. Even if they say there is no space, as you keep being competent, because God is blessing your work, it will, your competence will force a place for you at the top. He says, if you know any competence, he didn't say give me some of your brothers since they are your siblings, let me help them and give them juicy position in Egypt. No. He said, if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief S men. That's like saying chief uh, CEO, chief executive officer of my farm. That's what he's saying. Make them chief executive officer of my farm. But they won't just be ordinary people. They won't just be one of the shepherds. No, he said competent men among them. So you must distinguish yourself to be competent by being diligent. 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 Whatever your hand finds to do, the Bible says do it with all of your heart. Don't be passive with your work. Be active. Take it seriously. You have a few customers, serve them as if you are serving the whole world. And they will sing your praise everywhere they go. That is the way people rise. So don't do your job casually. Don't do your job grumbling. Do it with joy. Do it with joy. Your joy can be contagious because everybody is frustrated in, in the world. So when they come to you and they always get to infusion of joy from you. Everybody will look for the time you are there to come because they want some joy. They want somebody who will smile at them. They want somebody who will make them feel like a king and a queen. So if you do that, it's a matter of time. You will serve kings. You will not just stand before mere men. So your work is number four on your priority list. Put your work there. And in talking about our workplace, let's always remember because we are working hard does not mean we should not rest. It is not really working hard. It is working smart. In other words, engaging your time productively. Productively. And that will give you allowance to rest. Because your best creative self will not come out of your tired self. We will come out of your restful self. So if you are tired, you will be making mistakes. Have you seen that at work? If you are tired, you will be snapping at people. It happens. Why? You are just tired. So your best self will be projected in your work when you rest. So please take time to rest. Take time to rest. When you rest, you actually get to renew your strength to serve your gift better. To serve your gift better. Vacation must not be seen as a luxury. It must be seen as a necessity. This is preaching to me, myself, and I trust God that by the grace of God, we'll keep to it. That it's not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's a time to just shut down everything and just be with yourself, be with your family, and just enjoy life. Enjoy life. And when you do that, you come back to work recharged. You give better of your, you give, you'll be able to offer better part of yourself to other people because why? You have been recharged. And when we are talking about work, I want you to also know that this is one way you can work smart because it's working hard that can be destructive, but working smart can actually be very rewarding and very productive. And it's working smart that will make you a competent worker, not a working hard, just being there and just burn the time and burn the time so that they can say, wow, you are just coming from work. Ah, this man is working hard, though. No, it's working smart. 
And how can you work smart? Let's go to the Bible. Luke chapter 14. This is how to work smart. This is what God expects us to do, that we work smart as we do it. Luke chapter 14, verse 28 and 31. I will just skip because of my time. I read only 28 and 31. Verse 28, Luke 14, 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? And verse 31 says again, Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him, who comes against him with 20,000? What is this scripture t- teaching us? Is the principle of planning. When you plan, you will be able to work better. Have you noticed that when you stumbled into the day to just quickly rush to do things, you discover that you get less done? That when you sit down to say, I will do this first, do this second, do this third, you discover that you get to be able. And when you say that, you are portion time to eat. Because there's just a consciousness in you when you are wasting time to say, oh my God, this is what I should be doing. But when you have not pensed anything down, I'm telling you the truth. You will not even know you have wasted one hour on Facebook. But there just be a consciousness nudging your heart to say, no, you should be replying your email now. You should not be on Facebook. You should be replying your email. And that will force you to reply your email and that will help you to finish early and go home. Rather than, oh my God, I need to uh, reply all the emails and now you are in the office till 7.30, 8.30, 9.30. Why? Because the time you were meant to truly reply the email, you were on Facebook or you were talking to a friend. Let your friend know that your work hour is your work hour. Can I call you over the weekend? Let's talk over the weekend. That is working smart. Why? In my plan for today, I didn't create time for 30 minutes talk. I can't accommodate that. That is working smart. Planning. Planning. Have you seen Jesus Christ being, hey, there's trouble, call, call. He said, no, 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 no. We have to be in this place first, and we go to that place. That's Jesus Christ for you. He had a plan, and he stuck to his plan. He will say to them, no, today we'll be at Jerusalem, tomorrow we'll be in Judea. That is Jesus Christ. He had a plan. If the Son of God, who had the, the monopoly of wisdom, if he will come down, he will still have to plan. Then we can't do anything less. He wanted to feed the 5,000 people. He didn't just say, throw the bread at them. No. He created order. What was the plan? He said, the disciple, you line up in front of me. Tell them to sit down. In their sitting down, this is my mind now. Let them form a group of 50s. And those 50s, let them take a representative who will come. Because do you think it's Peter that went to 2,000 people? It couldn't have been. It couldn't have been. Hunger would have killed some people before they get to them. I'm telling you. But they created order by planning. You disciple take from Jesus. So Jesus only served 12 people. 12 people must have served maybe 100 people. 100 people now go and serve their group of 50s and group of 20s. And that was how the job was done. And that was the reason why they could even gather the remnant. If it's just all thrown around, everything would have just been out of place. Planning will help you to work smart and not just hard. Plan, plan. He says, have you seen a man that wants to do so? I had this challenge for several years in my life. I am a person that likes to walk in faith. So planning, I believe, is, is a clash with my faith because it means, but Holy Spirit is teaching me in recent times that, you know what? In fact, it is actually you putting your faith to work when you sit down to plan because you are already projecting those things that are not there. You are pu- you are arresting them from the spiritual realm and you are bringing them. When you write something down that was in your mind, do you know what you have done? You have concretized it. It was a thought. You can forget. But once you write it down, it becomes concrete. Now you can see it, you can touch it. And that's exactly what planning does. It helps you to work smart. It helps you to work smart. So faith is the connecting bridge between your limited supply and its limitless supply. This is what God told me. When I had challenge with always planning, I feel like, oh, no, God will fix it. No, God said, I won't fix it. You sit down and engage your mind to think. When I get to a place where I don't know what to write again, then I begin to say, Holy Spirit, what do I do? What do I do? And you begin to write down and begin to write down. And Holy Spirit taught me to say, you know what? Even though you think it's not enough, that's why you are not planning. It is your planning that will steer your faith to connect the endless supply. 
Because most times we feel like ah, it's not enough. Now let's just quickly see the one you can do. No. Still sit down and plan. Project. Make projection. And in your projection, don't look at the limited resources you have. Project based on what God has. You are spending from the pocket of Jehovah. So you can project based on that. And that is what will help you. An organized life is a product of organized thinking. And you cannot have organized thinking until you sit down to plan. Your thoughts will still be scattered. But the time you sit down to think and plan, what you are doing is you are arresting all your thoughts and you are bringing them into proper perspective. Are we getting what I'm saying? So an organized life is a product of organized thinking. You can solve your problem up front when you plan. When you plan, you solve your problem up front. Because now that you are planning, you now remember that, oh, we actually need round table, not uh, square. Because this place will not contain, it will not be able to enter the door. But if you have not planned and you just want to get a table, it's the day you bought the table, you discover, oh my God, this thing can't enter here. But when you t begin to think and plan, you'll be able to envisage problem and you begin to provide solution to them before they arrive. And when you now get to the place and the problem show face, you say, oh, I have your solution ready. Just roll it out. You can see how it becomes smart work. It's applicable in our office. It was Robert Schuller that says that people fail not because they plan to fail, but because they fail to plan. Lack of plan and goal is the clearest evidence of disorder in any life. Lack of plan or, and goals is the clearest evidence of disorder in any life or organization. I encourage you, please. God is a planner. Go look at it in the book of Psalm 139, verse 16. God said that before he formed us, he has written down all the things we will do. It's in the book of Psalm 139, verse 16. He said, all our days are already documented. Look at it. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. God planned for you. You are not a product of accident. He thought through you. He had an assignment for you. He knew all the specifications that need to be put into you to fulfill the assignment. He documented them. So that when they're in the factory of the womb creating you, they don't go and give you one future that will not be useful. No, God doesn't want to make any mistakes. So he wrote everything down. So we should pattern our life after God and we begin to see that our life will not just be about motion without movement. We now begin to make progress. And that's why God is telling us this before we enter into January again. Press reset button. You have done it the same way, the same way over the years. Don't do it the same way in 2024. Live with a plan. Live with a plan. Activity is not the same as productivity. You can be, you know, the rocking chair. There's so much motion, but there's no movement. So don't let your life be like that. And when you plan, you can actually take care of that right there. Productivity is primarily a result of organized thinking. Productivity is a result of organized thinking. And statistics have shown us that people that actually rise high in life, they are people that actually give to planning. I give to planning. Let's stop here for tonight. Uh, the last part of it we will discuss by the grace of God next week Wednesday as we are rounding off the year and we are also talking about preparing for 2024. Tonight, let's stand up. Let's appreciate God for his word. I hope you have had something that is beneficial to you. I just want you to appreciate God. Let's just give him glory. Let's give him praise for sending us the word again to challenge us to become better people so that we not just keep moving without making progress. Father, we thank you for your word. We receive your word with humility of heart. We do not fight your word. We receive it. Even that part of it that punches us so hard, we still receive grace to receive it, and we thank you, Father, that you are sending it to us at a time like this so that we can have a reset and so that we can have a better 2024. We praise and we honor your name. If you are here tonight, if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ and you are hearing this message and you're like, oh, my work, I will be diligent, I will make sure I'm competent, it won't work. Why? Because the race is actually not for the sweet. God must take his place in your life first. If he has not taken his place in your life, then all other things cannot fall into their places. I want to request that you give your life to Jesus Christ. It's simple. 
Is you believing in your heart that you need the help of God? You need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and then he's also your Savior. And as you believe that in your heart, you confess it with your mouth, then the Bible says you shall be saved. I want you to say after me tonight, Lord Jesus, I've come to you just as I am without one plea. I ask that you forgive me my sins. I ask, Lord, that you cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Wash me clean with your precious blood. And write my name in the Lamb Book of Life. Today, bring me into the family of God. And let every disorder be done away with in my life. In the name of Jesus. That my life begin to take shape as I make you my priority as from today. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. As you take communion tonight, we are going to be taking communion, trusting God for the grace to be the doer of the word. The grace. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, it says, and God is able to make all grace. So all this we have had today, ah, it's difficult. You don't know the kind of job I do. No, the Bible says God is able to make all grace. So ask God for grace tonight as you take the communion. The grace to be able to be diligent at work. The grace to be able to balance your work-life relationship. I want you to ask God for it. The grace to always prioritize accordingly. God first, yourself, family, then work come after. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you one more time for the privilege to gather at the table of communion. We never take this for granted. We never approach the table of communion with contempt. We come with a grateful heart, Lord. And we decree and declare, even though this is ordinary wafers and juice, we pronounce the blessing of the Lord upon it. And all those elements online too, we bless them in the name of Jesus. We decree and declare, they are no longer ordinary. Now they become the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. As we eat and drink this precious gift in the mighty name of Jesus, we are infused with divine wisdom in the name of Jesus Christ to be able to prioritize, to be able to apply wisdom of God in all areas of our lives so that our life will no longer be in disorder in the name of Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone sick in their body tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, this communion is a communion that established our covenant of oneness. As we take this by faith today, in the name of Jesus Christ, every infirmity, every sickness is hereby rebuked in the name of Jesus. We cast them out in the name of Jesus. We receive oneness of life at the table of communion. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Please, I want you to take it prayerfully. Take it prayerfully, address that area of your life that needs to be addressed. Maluskete ye, linda ya barushka, lekete tele ye, tika baru zelehenda kosha, lika tuskete yenda kuzetle hem baruska. The Bible says, in the same night that I was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said to them, take it. This is my body broken for you to keep you unto eternal life. As you take his body tonight, you are preserved from trouble. You are preserved from sicknesses and diseases. Because his body has been broken, yours shall not be broken. In the name of Jesus, no sickness will break your body. In the name of Jesus Christ, no disease will violate your health. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the same manner, he took the cup. He blessed it. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Drink all in the remembrance of me i want you to know tonight as you take this new covenant is a covenant that establish your ownness and as you take it by faith tonight in the mighty name of jesus your healing is established your healing is established in your mortal body right now your healing is established everything go in the name of jesus every sickness is disappeared in the name of jesus by the life of god infused into your body right now you receive the wholeness of life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. This is the time of the service where we honor the Lord with our substance. I want to encourage you, please package your tithe.
tithe is 10% of your earnings. Whatever God has brought into your hand, 10% of it is what you must honor God with according to his command in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, bring ye all tithe to my storehouse that there may be food in my house. It's also a good time to give your offering as you honor the Lord. Let's honor the Lord. I also redeem any pledge you may have, maybe building pledge, or if you have any special vow you have made between you and God, please redeem it. Don't exchange your tithe for your giving a building pledge. It's a different thing entirely. You don't do building pledge every time. It is just a special call that God is sending to us. But for your tithe, it's a regular thing that you do as God is giving you resources. Let's lift it up as we praise the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We lift up again our tithe, our offering, our deed, our pledge. Lord, we lift them up to honor you tonight. We use it, Lord, as a point of contact, even into your endless source. That, Lord, as we lift it up tonight to honor you all the days of our life, we will never know lack in the name of Jesus Christ. For every hand that is lifted, your hand will never go down in shame. Ever we always supply resources into your hand in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Father, Lord, for everyone paying their tithe tonight in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, according to your word, let every devourer be rebuked in their lives and let the heaven be opened over them in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, precious Lord. We honor and we praise you because you fulfill your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we praise Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming one more time. We appreciate you for those who are joining us online. We want to encourage you, please. Our prayer continues tomorrow at 6.30. Let's be there. And let's remember to invite people to church on Sunday. Please make sure you share the light of Christ. This truth that we are sharing here, many people need it. It will liberate them from every trouble that they have been going through. It's just the light that is coming from the scripture. It needs to be shared. And I encourage your heart, be the evangelist. Tell the evangelist, share the link, and let it just go viral and bless lives all across the world. And as you do that, the Bible says that great is the company of the people that publish his word. As you do that, God will make you great in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's share the grace in fellowship tonight. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. I'm a person of dominion. I live in dominion. Dominion over sin, sicknesses, diseases, oppression, poverty, and all the wickedness of the devil. I'm an outstanding success. I'm a peace setter. I'm a role model. I'm righteous. I'm rich. And I'm relevant. I'm born to win. And I'm born to reign. As you have declared with your mouth, so shall it be. You will always win. You will always reign. Nothing will displace you from the place of honor that God has positioned you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord prosper your journey in the name of Jesus. The Lord preserve your going out and your coming in. The Lord lift up his light of countenance upon you and show you favor. Even in uncommon places. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you and have a restful evening. In these challenging times, imagine a beacon of unwavering hope. Dominion International Center, Cyprus, is that beacon, guiding countless souls. But to amplify our reach, we need you. We're building a new sanctuary, a place to nurture souls and uplift our community. Each brick, each prayer is a step closer to that dream. Your generosity can spark hope and solidify our shared faith. Be the wind beneath our wings. Join our divine mission. Donate today at www.dicypress.org. Together, let's turn dreams into enduring pillars of faith. God bless you as you give.